that's every single sign we have. All right, well, thanks for coming today. I'm um, just going to have a bit of a look at maximising your sales team and the science of sales, um, but I want to point out that the reason that this uh, presentation is done using a sales team is the idea is this is for any manager that wants to learn how to set their team up to win a lot better in terms of systems and structures, but that the sales team is the hardest one to do it with because sales people are pretty out there. So this is not just for sales managers or for sales people, this is for anyone that wants to lead or manage people, um, but we're using the example of a sales team because it's the wriggliest team out. So are there any questions before we get started or anything? Can you define why the sales, the sales team is much wrigglier than that? Yeah, absolutely, happy to. Um, probably the main reason they do it with sales is because sales people tend to be the most extroverted and specific in their needs as well. So they're constantly asking for different things and all that sort of stuff. But that's not to say things against salespeople. The reason they're probably like that is they're the people that are most confident with dealing with new situations. And sales is usually the front line of the new changes in a business or the new directions in a business. So it's the salespeople that are generally copying the, uh, the brunt of a change in business direction or an expansion of the business. So it's not to say that salespeople are in their nature more wriggly. It's to say that the sort of people that are comfortable in the most dynamic environments are the people in the sales department. Does that answer your yeah, question? Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, any other questions before we get started? So I'll just quickly run through the agenda. Um, so we're going to be looking at the main elements of, uh, of managing a team, so hiring, training. Um, we're going to look at leads, and when we look at leads, this is looking at dealing with the operational component that your team uses. So if you, you know, run an operational department, just substitute leads for delivering stuff or building stuff or whatever. Or if you work in a business services division or department, then substitute leads for adding value to coalface workers or, or, or these sorts of things, or delivering stuff more efficiently. Um, then we're gonna have a look at accountability um, in marketing and sales. Um, this is an area where, particularly in sales, it's quite difficult to lock people down into accountabilities quite often. Um, and then we'll look at the actual doing of the work. So in this case, working the leads, and then we'll look at management and feedback, so how to create systems and structures which are more likely to make people win, um, and then rewards, and also then look at the qualities of a good sales manager as well, and have a little bit of a discussion actually about that. So this is um, this whole presentation is taken from um, a presentation and learning given us to a guy called Mark Roberge from a company called HubSpot that just won the second fastest growing tech company in the US, period. So they grew faster than Google this year. So that's pretty uh, impressive. And they're not a small company either. They've got 80 full-time frontline sales staff. So this is not an inconsequential company. Um, so yeah, they're basically operating in the most competitive web turf, which is telling people about how good their websites are. So if anyone knows about that space, it's a highly competitive space um, because everyone in that space is really, really good at sales and good at the internet. So. Um, yeah, he works in a very dynamic space, so he has to be pretty damn good in order just to keep things ticking along. Um, so, the sales executive. Let's have a look at the mission. This is predictable, scalable revenue growth. So, sales execs have a lot of different missions, but usually they boil down to something like this. <laughs> Grow our revenue, please, in a way that doesn't balloon out cost-wise and in a way that's not completely freaking random. Um, I think if most people could get their sales executive to do that, they'd be pretty happy. So I'm not saying this is the only mission of a sales executive, um, but this is the one that we're going to be sort of using for the example. Um, and also, if you're thinking about this in terms of your role as an exec or as a manager, you can obviously substitute your, your mission in for this mission and really think about what your mission is and how this presentation relates to your mission. So if we're looking for... Predictable, scalable revenue growth. Um, we're looking at four main areas. You want to hire the same type of successful salesperson. And this is something that's really important for predictability and scalability. You also want to train these people in the same way. Um, this is mainly around um, human resources and managing the people and trying to create fair accountability structures in, in your business or in your team. Um, then you want to provide each salesperson with the same quantity and quality of leads. And so this, once again, goes to human resources and accountability and also to rewards as well. If anyone ever has, has ever managed a sales team, the first thing that happens when you get your sales team to first go out there is they 
go out there and do a bit of work and then they just come back to you and say, you've given us crappy leads. And so unless you've created a fair and even playing field, you can't actually really have the conversation about whether the leads are any good, whether they're getting any better or worse, and whether or not anyone is dealing with the leads any better than anyone else. So we're going to have a really close look at that. And then the final thing is to have the salespeople work the leads using the same process. And this is one that's really quite difficult quite often because people want to do stuff their own way. Um, but it's very, very difficult to help someone get better at basketball if they're playing cricket, even if they're really, really good at cricket. So are there any questions before we move on to this first slide? Cool. So here's something to hit you with, a statement, that you want to hire the same type of successful salesperson or in the case of a different department, the same type of successful DJ or accounts person or whatever. Whenever you're dealing with duplicate roles, you're looking at hiring the same type of successful salesperson. Now, why do we care about that? Why would it be important? Why wouldn't you just hire any successful salesperson? Why would you care that they're all the same type of successful salesperson? Because that person's performance in the role will be predictable and you can predict what their needs in the role will be. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Because well, you can have a uniform approach to how you manage your team as opposed to having to sort of specifically tailor your management style to each person. Yeah, sure. We could use that same try and balance it between a wide variety of personality types to give variety to it. It means their communication on method and trainings and implementations have to be very sensitive to the needs of all those at the table. Yeah. Whereas when you have the same kind of person, you can just hone in on that one kind of personality type and present the way that they need to hear it and it can be a lot more efficient within dealing with one type that's not so sensitive. Yeah. And this is something to really think about in terms of a business structure and specialisation is that not everyone in the business is going to be suitable for every role, but if you've got a business that's got a broad role structure, <coughs> then within departments you should be able to specialise a fair bit and say, we'll take these type of people and you take those type of people. You know, you're not looking for the same people to be MCs and accounts payable. You know, and that's two slightly different personality types there. Um, so, yeah, good observation there, Anthony. Now, there's some... The good thing I liked about this presentation when, when it was given to us at MIT was that they didn't, weren't just saying do this because some guy at a university told me to do it. They actually just went through and said, okay, who in our team is winning and what are the qualities that they have and how likely is a quality to be associated with a winner in our team? So they actually did some proper data analysis with a lot, a lot of salespeople. And what they've got here is the data of what they learned, um, where for at least their team, they found, you know, they looked for the top seven things which were predictive of success in their sales, sales staff. And what you've got is you've got three columns along here. Now, they had three different ways of rewarding their sales staff. The first one was a quota attainment thing. So if you got a certain percentage of your quota, then you were good. So they were rewarding people based on their ability to attain the quota. Then they changed to a system um, which was more around um, the value of the client in terms of whether or not they actually ended up going through with the deal. And then they had this one, which was, this stands for long-term value. So this was about, or lifetime value, how much value they got out of a client over the whole term of their use of the, of the business, um, whether or not the salespeople, so they rewarded the salespeople based on the lifetime value of the customer, not whether they just got them in the door. Um, so as you can see, they had all these different things on their scorecard that they were looking for, but what they found is in all three situations that there was a quite a good correlation between just a few of the skills and people actually winning in the role. And so this is something to really think about is that they were hiring a lot of different people, but really they could have just been hiring people just with these attributes rather than the whole lot. And they would have been getting, you know, strong performance and not negative performance. So are there any questions about this idea of hiring the same type of successful salesperson? How does this apply to a business level this size? What's the, what's the like, actual direct application to us? Obviously, we don't have the resources to run this kind of testing. We run other types of personality testing or result testing, or is that only top grade or consumer results? Or? 
well, this is probably making a bit more sense why we do things like personality type testing and why we do top grading and why we have a bit of a think about these things because this is, you know, really great research to have done, but we don't have the budget for it. So the question is, someone's already done some of this research and we can learn from it, what can we take away? And what, what of this is relevant to our business? Does anyone have any thoughts about These are effectively competencies on the scorecard. Yeah, this is, yeah, yeah. This, they, not effectively. These were the competencies on the scorecard. <laughs> yeah, and so they actually went, well, these are the competencies we're hiring on. Which ones of them are actually important? And they were able to significantly refine the scorecard by actually correlating between people that tick these quality boxes and the ones that were actually successful. Mm. And go, wow, ability to close a sale is a big thing that we hire people on. And there's no correlation with the ability to close a sale and actually, actually making money. Oh, so this, is, being <laughs> this is all artifact. This isn't part of their interview process. No, no, no. This is, they, went, they interviewed people and said, what are the person's qualities? Mm. And then they go, did this person win? Oh, okay. Right. And do you, do you see what they did? <coughs> yeah. And so yeah, they yeah. said, okay, which, which are the qualities that we see the winners having? Mm. And which are the qualities we see the losers having? Has this been implemented at Griffin yet at any scale? Not directly. Even from your level, just trying to partner with something like, you know, like that. Doing the data analysis. No, and actually to a team place based on the same values. And, um, oh, no, definitely not. Okay. No. Um, it was before when I was running DJ department. I was trying to find DJs that were all in that hosting style. So we let a lot of people like, you know, Chris Spears and um, DJ Chronic and, you know, these guys, we didn't, you know, they came to us and like, trained with us or hired with us or all that sort of stuff, but they weren't a match for the qualities I was looking for. They were much more entertaining guys. You know, they wanted to play at festivals and be out there and touring and all that sort of stuff. And so the skills that they had, which were amazing, we went, well, that's not a match for the skills that we're looking for because we're looking for more hosty sort of people that really value the social interaction and really want to build a community in a place. It's a little bit counterintuitive, this idea of hiring the same type of successful salesperson sometimes because a lot of people want to sort of hedge their bets, if you know what I mean. Have you thought about that sort of juxtaposition? I mean, if you've got the same type of person and your system sucks, then the same type of person is systematically going to fall over every time. So one of the things I wanted to point out about this sort of a system is if you're going to hire the same type of successful salesperson, it's a double-edged sword. It means you're going to have to have a good system. But the other side of it is if you've got all the same type of person in the role, you can afford to spend some time on making a good system because a lot of people are going to be using it and it's not going to be changing every five minutes. Seems like um, Pareto principle, 80% of the results come from 20% of the effort and you don't need to do research, it's still what they've come up with because they've done it and it's so obviously it's still their top eight. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah. There's nothing to stop you re doing that. Recreate the wheel. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? It's just like asking someone that's already done it. Well, it just depends if you've got the sale, same sales process or the same similar kind of product. That might, that might work for their product, that might not work for our product. Mm. But the thing is, if you have that diverse group to begin with and then you narrow down who's winning that group and you find out what, the, what those qualities they share amongst them, you just to work it out ourselves and on a smaller scale. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's very much the process I used to figure out which DJs we wanted. I just went around to the clients and found out which clients were happy and then found out who the DJs were and looked at when people were complaining about DJs, the types of people those were. So, so integration to Griffin, this can be done at the interview entrance stage from HR and then that could have access even once they enter the company. To a company level and that can pull from a database when everyone's hiring internally. Yeah, definitely. This, this, this sort of data exists around the place. I mean, we're still learning a lot about the personality types that suit site coordinating, for instance. You know, we're trying lots of different personality types and lots of different people in the site coordinator role and we're discovering lots of things about, you know, which sort of people can win in a site coordinator role and especially we're finding that maybe different types of people win at different levels or stages in the development of a venue too. And so we're learning more and more all the time about this. What I really wanted to pull your mind to here is the idea that that can be more systematic maybe than we do it now. And secondly, that there are specific tangible advantages to having 
similar or the same type of person in multiple duplicate roles. So the next thing to do is have a think about how you're actually sourcing and selecting people. So Mark was so generous as to share his sort of standard form for finding candidates. They have to interview and, uh, and screen and select a lot of people for their team. And so what he was pointing out was that if you've got specific qualities or traits that you know are indicative of success in your existing team, then why not give those, those qualities different weightings in your interviews? So you can see they've got all the different skills, um, the criteria that they're looking for down the left here, and they're giving a weighting here to the importance of these different things to give them a more objective way of figuring out who might actually win in the role. So they know that work ethic, coachability, intelligence, passion, and preparation or HubSpot knowledge are really, really, really important particularly this top three. Like, if someone's got a great work ethic, they're coachable and they're intelligent, they're very, very likely to succeed in, in their sales team. And so they've given these a weighting of eight. So it means if you get a 10, you get 80 points. So that's, you know, whereas if you get a 10 for being brief or competitive, you only get 30 points. And so can you see what they're doing there? Yeah. Is they're actually creating a weighting system and going... If we know that something is very, very predictive of success, then why not in the interview, uh, why in the interview wouldn't we give it more weight in terms of scoring people to find out whether or not they're likely to win? I'm really quite passionate about this because nothing really irks me more than when I put someone into a role and they don't win because it's kind of like stealing someone's life a bit and I don't like it. You know, I don't like the idea of tricking someone into trying to do something for three months of their life which they end up not being able to do and then you don't get what you want and they don't get what you want. It just seems like a massive gigantic waste of everyone's life. <laughs> so for me, I'm quite passionate about these ideas of really trying to figure out what someone exactly looks like when they're going to win in a role and then putting them in there to win and things like this therefore to me are very interesting to really be thinking about how I can get more and more skillful at really picking whether or not someone's going to win in a role I was just going to ask around the group and see if anyone else had any experiences of interviews or scorecards or situations where they feel like they've really well placed someone into a role or someone else has really placed them well into a role and really picked it. Does anyone have any experiences like that where you've really nailed it or someone's put you into a role and they really nailed it? Yeah. So when I was, I used to be um, a marketing VP for Griffin, and then you moved me into operations, and yeah, just immediately started smashing out the goals there, because it was just very, like, week by week, inch by inch basis, and I guess that was, I guess it's an example of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is, I remember we had that discussion, yeah. and I was really passionate about, and I'd spent a lot of time thinking about where does Joe fit? Yeah. And I was absolutely convinced based on all your skills and competencies and looking at where you kept winning. And I just went, why is this guy marketing? His skills and his ability to win do not match there. Like he's working really hard to just get through. And so, yeah, then when I looked at the operational scorecard, I went, oh, wow, that seems like much more of a match. He was nowhere near this scientific though. Yeah, of course. One I've got is not so much one that I've actually hired or anything like that, but it was along the lines of, I had a student when I was teaching at Regency that um, wasn't a fit for where he was working. He was working at Woolworths and he had too much passion and, and too much skill set to work at a place like that that limited him. 
So I ended up finding another job elsewhere for him at an independent bakery that did everything. And uh, he ended up going on and actually buying that bakery. So it's, that was more finding a place that was better for his skill set or his passion that, you know, where he was working was like, he couldn't, does that make sense? But to, that's yeah, that's exactly, perfect sense. Yeah, so I didn't actually hire him, but I actually helped him move from where he was to somewhere where it was better, he was better suited. Yeah. And there you're talking about the difference between a business owner and a absolute base level Woolworths mm-hmm. worker. So it's a pretty big difference when you get this right. Mm. Any sporting team, pretty much. Any coach will look at some certain attributes in players in key positions and normally put them in the... Like a centre-back has to be six foot two at least and big and just like Pakistani. <laughs> Whereas like a winger has to be you know, fast and um, fast acceleration off the mark and um, quick turn and stuff like that. So similar concept. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same. It is exactly spot on. That's really the way it's going now. Yeah. John got it right, Colin. We didn't. What about exceptions to that, though? When you get freaks that don't fit the normal. What's well, worth bringing up? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Right, look at okay, I think it's sporty. Look at you saying, Bob. That guy should not be the fastest <coughs> one in the world. Like he's, he is like seven foot tall. He's like four inches too tall for sprinting. His body type is gangly. Like he's not meant to be a sprinter. Yet he's Aren't like, talking like, good at sprinting? Like, that's 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 that. What defines a sprinter? No, but like, but okay, so he did the mold of a sprinter. Or traditionally, what, what, what? Traditional mold? Like six foot tall, like stockier, like short, like twitch muscle fibers, that kind of stuff. Like, if you can get a taller person with bigger muscles, yeah, work faster in the same ratio as a small person would, they're going to run faster. But are they naturally able to perform at the same ratio as what someone smaller is? They will be able to. You can perform it, you can train it. But it's not naturally what's considered the mold. Well, what I'm saying is not, it's not possible, I'm saying it's not a mold, yeah? It's not, mm. not a traditional mold. Uh-huh. But that's what I'm trying to say. If we've got traditional models of what we're looking for in people, and like we've got this type, we're obviously going to be exceptions now, allies to those things we're looking for. So, how do you identify the outliers that are going to be the Usain Bolts? Yeah. They're just going to mock it. Then it comes down to if you want one person to be an absolute Usain Bolt, or you want a team of people who can run the, the 100 meters in 10.8 seconds, you want just one guy who can run 10.6. Mm-hmm. It comes down to what you're what you, what you, what you huh. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean. I, I think you've actually hit on something very, very important there. Have a think about how sprint teams work. How do sprint teams really work? There's a coach who's trying to get a certain level of performance. Yeah? And the coaches that end up at Olympic level are the ones who train the relay teams that win, primarily. Yeah? Not the individual sprinters. This is something really important to think about because you've hit on something very, very important here is that traditionally, you know, there's been a few countries that have had really, really taken sprinting really, really seriously and they've had these amazing elite level coaches. But what <coughs> happens over time is the coaches, instead of trying to make the world's best sprinter, they just end up trying to keep their job as the Olympic team sprint coach. And so they don't want to take any risks. And so this is where, as Sean's pointed out, you've got to have that balance between stability and innovation. But the thing I'd like to point out to you at the stage that we're at is that at the moment, what's more important for us? Stability. I disagree. Hmm? In some in some areas. Not myself. Uh, for example, if I had someone in one of the hearts, for example, with Ben Sophia, who was just an absolute freak, I could just manage them individually. It would be so much more effective and much more value to this company. And the value added would just be amazing. Like, because it's all individual people working on a, on a, on a goal level. And like, it doesn't need a ton of... The, the risk in bringing in those kind of individuals who are quite special versus having a stable function team, I think the return on that is really more. But uh, is there a risk on people you're trying to bring in? But obviously, it's not, you know, to get it, it's just a very calculated risk. But what I'm saying is like, if you gave me five people that run a 10.5, I'd rather take the one that's 9.6 to certain departments in my service team. Well, it depends on the size of the department. If you look at the DJ sure. department, though, it's completely the opposite. I mean, heaps of DJs are pulling in different directions that don't work as a single team. Very good point. So you're starting to see that this is horses for courses, yeah? It depends what outcome you're trying to get, you know? If you're trying to get the single, a singular result once, then maybe you don't want to do this. 
But if you're trying to get a sustained result that matters over a period of time, then maybe this is more important. And that's going to vary in different departments in the business in, at different times in the business. And so you really need to be aware, and it's really good that Sean's pointed it out, that this is a great system or a great approach if you're looking for this sort of a result. You know, come back to the mission. Yeah? If you're looking for predictable, scalable revenue growth, then this is the sort of things that we're talking about. Yeah? But if you're trying to fire a rocket to the moon, maybe not so much. So that's a good point. So the next thing Mark was doing with us is he was giving us some probable success criteria um, and some interview questions. And what he was really talking about here was how to actually ask questions that are actually going to be diagnostic of whether or not the person is going to fit in the role. So this is actually something really important to think about is that if you don't set up your interview to actually be diagnostic for the qualities that you're looking for, then there's no point in being surprised when you don't get the people that you want. So this is a question for any exec and probably more of a one for HR as well, which is how do you find good salespeople? Because this is not a question of how do you find good salespeople really in this context. It's how do you find good people? In the context of this discussion, we're talking about how would you find good salespeople because we're using sales as an example. So how do you spot amongst the crowd the people that are going to be the match for the role that you're looking for? about the qualities you're looking for and results that you want. Mm. Yeah. Tailor your sourcing around the kind of person you're looking for. So if you're looking for like hotshot salespeople, look to like you know marketing departments or even other companies that have been successful with their sales departments. Um, you know, structure your the way that you're actually enticing these people in a way that would appeal to someone of that type. Any other ideas? These are great these are great suggestions. How do you spot great people, Joe? How do you figure out who you're going to move up in your team? Or who you're going to bring onto your team? How do you know the talent you're looking for when you see it? Well, for someone on my team, it's, it's based on the work they've done previously, so how well they've done in the past. Um, and that's also probably the same even for someone that didn't know, and that's why we use, I guess, the top grade interviews to turn, try and presence them to uh, the past and get them to sort of speak about what they've achieved in the other roles, and if they've done well, then they're more likely to do well in the, in the new world. Mm. It's an excellent point. Mm. Sean, hello, Josh. How do you guys spot the right person for the role? For me, it just depends on the department. So I was looking for me down, so I could look for someone who can. Um, can work the key system, uh, the systems and works in a systematic way and can work the leads in that manner. Um, in terms of like stuff I've done with that snap though, like an example would be I spotted this person putting status up who was a possible sales guy, had a target of 3,000 and then his son had a target of 5,000 instead of on the one day. So for me, I might then follow that person, see if they're doing more updates like that and I could someone could then probably bring in and go, this person sales is going to want them on my team. So they've got, obviously it's got a key, like, like Joe says, like, you know, they're showing a key history of being able to do it over time. Yep. But then having said that, they're the right personality type and they should have sent characteristics I might give them a shot anyway, even though they yep. have the history behind them. Yep. So a few both characteristics and history are important. Yeah. Cool. Any other ideas? I agree with you, Aaron. I think this is the core competence that I'm looking for and I know where to see in the role and that's what I'm basing my judgments off about who should come into the department. It's critical. Yep. And, it's, it, and also my, how they'd operate with my personal personality type. And how that fits in with like, their key things. And... That's a very important point that no one's raised yet. I think over-dependence personality types is a bit of a down because 
thing in the human is not get along with a lot of women, but whole opposite sides of the personality mm-hmm. to it. But I've never had any issue with him getting along really well. Can't push back. Go very careful my communication with you. <laughs> Maybe but I was technically <laughs> even more opposite though. Yeah. And like, yeah, I, I, I get along. Yeah, yeah, my friendship level is fine, but you like just on a, on a, on a you, like understand as well. Also, our thought processes are very different. Yeah, yeah. and so just making sure we're in tune with each other's thought processes and how it works. So I just need to be careful. Well, I don't mind the blah. I'm just rail on and trying. This is what needs to be done logically. This is this needs to be a dick thing. Like I might. Yeah, say it's like say how it's bishop will turn around and like yeah you're right or you're wrong for this reason like, oh yeah I'm wrong and so the like the way I can communicate different things is different. It's just do you know what I mean? Like that's not an insult to you. It's just it's just be really careful how you do that. Like, do you know what I mean? Like how we communicate. Like for example, we had a meeting like we had a meeting yesterday with, two days with Alex that was just blunt and just outrageously to the point and just stupidly direct. And it was probably like the most really effective life changing me. But like, I wouldn't do that for other people that were in my side so. I think the general point is still valid, which is that you want to be thinking about who they're working with. Mm. I think that is relevant. And that's the general point. Is that the general point that you're talking about? Yeah, is who they're reporting to and who else is in their team. Is on the team and reporting to. Yeah. Some people work better online, some people work better in groups. You know, some people work better with certain personality types. Some people work better with, better with others. Some people are volatile and their results are unpredictable. Some people are really, really predictable, but they're not going to do anything spectacular. So depending on what department you're in, knowing the reporting structure and who they're going to be working with could be an important concern. It may not be, but it's, it's interesting that you bring it up, Sean. Did you want to add anything from your experience, Josh? I love the coachability and passion. If I'm home with my business, um, I don't really care about their success and past, um, and I think we can take canvases. So if you've got a bit of a passion for, say, for fitness or for health or not, I can develop that, I can build that within that. You know, and, um, and obviously they're, they're getting along with me, they're working with me, and you know, looking to get on the core clientele base because I attract certain types of clients, you know, and I work with a certain type of clients. So I've trained with them now, you know, she works well. Um, she has a passion, and I've sort of coached her through doing what she can do. So they can't, you can't coach if they're set in their ways, and you're not going to be able to really sort of get them as on board as you know, like it's a um, company or business consistency. So there's there's a fundamental sort of consistency within sort of my size itself, and if I get another trainer and it's completely opposite to all that, the actual idea behind that comes down. So the business branding goes down. So the main things I look for, but completely different sort of businesses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're talking a bit there about um, finding people who are a value match or have shared values with the rest of the team. Is, is that the sort yeah, of thing you're yeah, talking yeah. about? Yeah, Sh- shared values and um, the main one's probably like a thirst for, to learn more. So mm-hmm. we're, we're um, well, you, yes, tons of trainers, uh, tons of health professionals, but um, it's only the select sort of Two to three percent that want to study more than we'll get anyway, and I want those two to three percent. So if I'm talking to someone, they say, oh yeah, I know this, that, and I'm going to interview with someone and um, tell them all the stuff they've done, their successes in the past, ask them how they've done that, and it doesn't really fit with, you know, if I put someone on a diet or did this machine work, it doesn't really work with um, with what I sort of um, philosophise in the business. Mm. Yeah. So, we've shared a lot of different ways to find good people, and what Mark was talking to us a lot about was what definitely doesn't work, what might work, and what actually works in in his experience, in his business, and this is what I wanted to share with you is is what he found, is um, advertising tended not to work, so seek and stuff would be our equivalents of, of monster.com. Um, is that contentious? That, that outbound marketing might not be all that effective? <laughs> um, seems obvious, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's maybe something for HR to think about as well is, is how we're streaming the inbound and outbound components of, of our search for people as well. Um, but not just for HR, for everyone, because everyone's always on the lookout for good people. 
Now, they find, found some things that might work. Um, these are the things that for their business work sometimes and not others. Um, and this was agencies and recruiters. So this was getting someone else who's a professional at finding good people to find people for you. And this was, I think, a little bit of a shock for, for a lot of people was that people who are professionally trained to find good people don't always get the result at the end of the day. Ty's nodding his head. Have you had an experience? Yeah, I know very, very well why. Um, they're, they're all good. It's, it's a lot of... Uh, for a general... I know it sounds silly, but for a general job, it works. Which is just, you know, just something that's, that doesn't involve too much skill or is pretty much on the job training. It, it seems to work okay because their systems and processes seem to find that right person. When it's for a skilled person, say, i.e. baker, um, that person needs to have a certain amount of skill and level. It's it's easy for that person to bullshit to that other person because that other person doesn't know that that person's bullshitting, if that makes sense. So like if I'm going for a baking job and I'm not, I don't have the qualifications and you're the, you're the person trying to hire me, I can bullshit off to you because you don't know that role as well as, as what the actual baker does, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think for a general job, they work. For a more skilled, direct type of job, they, they don't work. And I've had experiences with them in the past. Has anyone else got any thoughts, experiences, ideas about agencies and recruits? Well, we're specialised day three. Don't we do this in the moment? Then you'll succeed. We do this a ton in the moment. Sorry? We do this a ton in the moment. Now, how so? I'm not saying that we don't. I mean, this is interesting. We have a very, um, we have a certain individual on the on the exec team who loves doing this and who in fact we're investing our time and money to doing this. Into what? What do you think? What do you think? Um, what's that thing called? Outsourcing? What's that? Oh, yes. What do you think? Oh yes, it's an agency. It's a it's a way to it's a, it's a form of an agency. It mediates. It's more of a facilitator. Are they not facilitators? But like Ty said, we the low skill people. Not no, exactly, and that's why we retire. I think for, for low volume general labour, I don't think this is a negative thing. But ultimately, that's not what turns the business over. Mm. Nor we're looking for a sales team or some of that initiative. But I think for general labour, this is becoming viable in a certain way, and saving us a lot of money. The good thing about this is you can look at all the feedback from the previous work. Yeah, but that's just the agency set up correctly, yeah? If it's a good agency, I'll do it. It's just ODS is a deficient agency that you can actually choose what you use or what you don't use. Mm. They facilitate. Is this Mitch? Huh? Is this Mitch? Yeah. <laughs> the one in Eddie Burnley. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying it's a really good thing. I got them onto it. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah so but what I'm saying is, is that not agency? Mm. But I'm looking at that as an expendable thing too. There's not something you're not actually literally hiring that person yeah, to work with you within, within your company. Okay. You can actually turn and go, no, that was shit. See you later. I'm not going to worry about it. You don't have any connections with them. Where if you physically if you're physically hiring someone, I think yeah, that's a different story. So I can I can understand where you're coming from. I agree. That's just a change in how we're going to society in general. But the same. Person. Yeah, you don't have to look at the person's face going what what yeah it's like. Anyway, I'm just trying to throw some. Yeah, it's great. It's a great discussion. Yeah. And I think from what I can tell of our use of agencies, it might work. As in, sometimes it will be really, really good and sometimes it will be epic fail. So, yeah. And, <laughs> sorry? I guess that is actually good. <laughs> yeah? Sound, sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. When I use Odesk, this is how I use it. I get the job and I give it to two people. <laughs> And I'd pay twice because <laughs> it's actually easier for me to just... But once you find that person, you stick them. Exactly. That's what I mean. So, you know, it might work. I really treat Otis like might work. I don't rely on any one person on Otis that I haven't worked with before Mitch to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> what I do on Otis is give them a simple task that I don't care if they fuck up. Hmm. A bullshit task that I just make up and then to get them to prove themselves to me. And once they've proved it, then I just give them that actual task. So this is what, at least for HubSpot, they found works. Networking at events and online. Passive recruiting on LinkedIn. Referrals. And this was a really interesting one, which was taking meetings with salespeople. So we'll talk about that one last because it's the most interesting. But networking at events and online. So this is about... 
getting people where they're talking about what they do. And this is something really worth thinking about. Um, one of the things I'm looking at more and more is finding the things that people say online that are in line with what we do. So actually looking for people that use words that are really like our values a lot when they speak online. To me, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea for recruiting. I mean, if someone's saying the sorts of things that we say online a lot, it could be a really interesting way for us to source people. Another one is passive recruiting on LinkedIn. So this is, I guess, the inbound version of an agency. So rather than saying, we're looking for this sort of a person, going, this is the sort of company that we are. What do you think about that? And seeing what people say. So that's another thing to think about. Um, you know, this is why you know, I've been encouraging Anthony to blog because this is a really cool, different approach for recruiting people is actually to say what we're about and see who that resonates for. The third one, and this was a really, really big one for them, was just referrals. Just the basic top grading concept of A players want to work with A players. The only downside of this is that if your team is made up of B and C players, then they're not going to refer any A players. <laughs> so this requires a very important prerequisite, which is no dead wood in your team. Because also, A players don't really refer A players if they're already working with B players. Because they don't want to pull their A player friends into a B player environment. Because then their friend just looks at them and says, why did you bring me here? You're a douchebag. Mm -hmm. Or the A player comes in, kicks goals, and B player looks like a dickhead. Mm. One more left. <laughs> and the final one is a really interesting one um, Mark was telling us about one of his main ways of recruiting which was people would ring him up and try and sell him something and so he would say yeah oh you know his PA would go I've got this guy on the phone that wants to sell you this thing it's like I'll take the call <clears throat> And his assistant's like, okay, you're a crazy person. <laughs> but he would actually, when someone was coming at him, demonstrating the sorts of things he was looking for, he'd just let them come. <laughs> and so this was a huge one for me when I was working more on the front line and, and, and recruiting in Griffin was I'd really spend a lot of time looking at my ambassadors and just seeing how they would behave. And actually letting them talk to me about what they do and what they like and how they see things. And actually interviewing them just sort of invisibly. Sorry? Sorry that um, Daniel Whiskey Haynes. Um, yeah, Ty's. I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, Ty Baxter. Yeah. So I can. Yeah, I, wish, I wish I'd taken a film of you at Red Square. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Sorry? Was he oh, I was a red square. He was a wigger. <laughs> I, I was up on the block for the black guys. Yeah, with the black guys. <laughs> and, and we really took notice of this. And just went, this guy... He's a freak. He's so black. Yeah, he doesn't give a shit. Like, he is about this and he loves it and he's not going to let anyone tell him any different. And that was a really... You know, that was a real value match for us back then. And it really stood out. And so, yeah... Barrel, up, barrel him up and have a chat to him and see what he says and you really get a lot of values information out of people when they're passionate like that. Stuff that you, you know, maybe never ever get out in an interview because you can't get someone as present as when they're in the moment trying to do what they already do. And that's why I think this, those, and that's why I think those four methods work, especially for this company, is because those people aren't, ten, aren't necessarily looking for a job so they don't have to have that time of actually trying to impress you. So they're actually in their own comfort zone. And that's why I say Red Square. I was in my own comfort zone. David saw me being comfortable being me. You know, and I obviously fit, even when I was drunk, um, I obviously fit what, what you're saying is the culture and that back then. So he's seeing me relaxed and normal. Where when you're in an interview with someone, well, maybe not so much normal, but um, when you're in, having an interview with someone, they're all tense and trying to impress you the whole time. 
Mm. I had an experience with this when I was walking down the street to buy a burrito. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this dude, like, you know those people on the street who, like, try and get you to give money every month to charity? Like, he leapt out of me, like, literally leapt out on the footpath and stopped me. And I was like, look, man, I actually have to go get food and stuff. And he actually managed to keep me there for a good 15 minutes, even though it was going to make me late to a huddle. So I was like, look, you did very well. Do you want to, like, apply on our website? I think you'd be good at hosting. Like, yes. <laughs> 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 So what makes these things work, in your opinion? What makes these four things work when advertising and getting someone else to do it don't seem to work as often? Why do you think these things tended to work for, for market least? And, and do you think that counts for you or for us? Well, so the underlying thing on each one is the people that are coming in are comfortable in their own situation. The networking, it's relaxed, it's comfortable. Passive recruiting at the beginning, um, referrals and, and taking dips was comfortable and you're getting the triggers under the person. Hmm. That's a good point. <coughs> I was going to go somewhere like say they're engaged at each other's level. So the, the passive crew, they're engaging with you. And um, the networking obviously is engaging back. It's a referral is to be engaged by the friends to come in. So I came in. Obviously they were trying to sell you something. Yeah. I think it's to do with trust levels. I think it's high trust in the bottom category as opposed to the top category. It's lower. I think trust is the word that I'm looking for. Yeah. Or authenticity. High exposure. That's a good point, Aaron. High exposure, Sean, you say. You have exposure to those people in those situations and continued exposure to them. It's not a rat one. Referrals, networking events online, meeting sales people, they're like, you actually have exposure to how they're working, how they operate. So it's not just coming to an interview lead, you've seen them over an extended period of time and how they act. React, interact, and act on certain principles. Oh, okay. Engage on a more long-term basis. Long-term meaning. Personal. Yeah, a more personal basis, and not just on a YouTube basis. So you see them variety of things. Yeah. Or the desire to waste them. It's a good point. It's a good point. Just elaborating on my one, I think it's because they're actually showcasing themselves in that a similar or like similar role to what you're you're probably going to hire them for anyway. So, and like I said again, they're they're not trying to show off; they're just doing their job. Where, like I said, if in the interview, they're trying to show off to you. So I think it's yeah, they're just in their comfort; they're in their zone; they're doing what they do naturally, and you get to see that. One of the things that I really keep coming back to when I look at this slide is that A players aren't looking for work. And that's a huge one for me with this. Is that people that are really, really good at stuff aren't looking for a job. They're kicking butt in a job. Because <laughs> that's what A players do. They're not unemployed. They're never unemployed. They've always got two or three people that are you know, interested in bringing them onto their team and they move around where is a match for them value-wise. And so that's, um, I guess, one other thing that I wanted to you know, point out from my own experience is that most of the people that we put into Griffin who have been winners weren't looking to work with Griffin. They were already winning at other things and they went, oh, this is an interesting community. I might find out a bit more about it. So that's just some, some of my thoughts. So the next thing to think about is training your salespeople in the same way. Why do we, why do we care about training salespeople in the same way? Well, this is Mark's observation at many companies is the training process is that you follow around someone who's kicking butt for about a month and read the manual. And that's the training process. Sound familiar? Uh. <laughs> Let me just play my split room. <laughs> and this is how most people learn most jobs. 
This is how lawyers learn to be good lawyers. Sorry? Probably my best. Yeah. Shadow someone else who's better at it around and do it the way that they do it. And read a manual. So that when you don't do it the right way, someone can put in a line in the manual and say you broke the rule. Now that's a pretty good way to train people, but it's not the best way. Probably. Best practice looks different to that. Has anyone heard of a thing called a playbook? Yes. Where, where have you heard of that before? I made one. Sorry? I made one. Yeah, tell us more about that. So, I was coaching a play master team, same age as college, and we were preparing for an estate tournament, and they wrote up like a 30 page book with a step by step guide of all the different plays and structures that we run in the last week on and then And then it had all of our team rules, team dynamics, um, situations, how to react to different things, our preparation the tournament and profiles of each player in the book. And then it was like, then every single play around came straight from the playbook. It was easy going down the court and having a point guard call out the, the name of the player we're running and this is working out properly. Mm -hmm. We lost on a three point buzzer beater from the opposite three point line. If an opposite three point line heat the whole way of the court with point one second left. So it wasn't but, but, but this is we were massive underdogs in that time and not expected to reach in our finals. The results were amazing. I got a massive pay bonus when I got that. <laughs> I've got to introduce you to Jess's dad. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead and from St. Ames, I'll get you 500 bucks on your home. So, some people have heard of it. Does anyone, does this sound like something else that's not called a playbook that you're familiar with? Have you ever used something like this in a job before? Yeah. yeah. West Tech have got a lot of scripting around pretty much all those things. Like it, like a cheat sheet almost. I think we refer to Griffith as a CRM. I suppose, in, I suppose in my line of work, it would be fault finding and what you need to do to fix the faults. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused. When we talk about um, a sales book versus a manual, like all those things it says there, you need value proposition. That sounds like all the tools that they'll use on the job to make them more effective, the things they need to know. How is that different from the manual? It's a fair question. Does anyone have a, know the difference I'm, I'm between a manual and a playbook? It seems as though all that's happened here is they've changed the word manual to playbook. It explains the manual. It's more step by step. Must yeah. be done this manner and a playbook yeah. is more open and flexible to how they operate. Exactly. The way, that's the difference. Yeah. yeah. The way I was going to explain it is the manual is just straightforward where a playbook is gives you variables. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. so my playbook had like a thousand different things to run off different reads and stuff like that that then have open to one call. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's similar to a manual, but it's much more flexible. Talks more about best practice and things to watch for at each step. I used to use a thing, um, I used to work for the um, Australian Cadet Corps. So most of our stuff was from the Army. And we had these things called Standard Operating Procedures or SOPs. Oh, and I hated them. But the thing that devastated me about them was when we started doing operations with three or 400 people, how effective they were. And I remember we were doing this training operation which would have had about 400 kids running around at a, a, quite an isolated military training base um, a couple of hours north of here. And the ability for a group of about 30 or 40 adults and about 20 kids to coordinate these 400 kids using these standard operating procedures was really brought home to me because when we were just doing them with our group of 10 or 20 people, it seemed like a whole lot of extra work. But once we were trying to actually coordinate 400 people through three different levels of command, sticking to the SOPs made all the difference. And I didn't really get the importance of it until we had a standard operating procedure around having a centralised location for all um, radio commands and observa radio observations. And so we had the central command post where anyone who made any observation radioed it back to the central place and they had this massive map of the area and they would track movements of everything. And we could actually, without any one group needing to see, you know, we didn't have to really do anything just by people keeping their eyes open and giving information back to the middle. We were actually able to form a complete picture of exactly where everyone that was sort of our enemy that we were working against, exactly where they were moving at all times. So, without actually having to tell anyone to tell anyone where anyone was moving. 
And it was really, really cool. And it showed me the value of a playbook quite early in my, in my days. So what they found at HubSpot at least is that a playbook, something which you know, tells, gives you information about the uniqueness of the value proposition or what the competitive advantage is that we're working in, the target customer, the competition, the common objections and the product information, just having those key bits of diagnostic information somewhere really helps people win. The next one is to train salespeople as consultants or experts. So not to teach them to be better at sales, but to teach them to be better at knowing your product. And the final one is using exams and certification programs. This one blew me away. <laughs> I'm just like, wow, wonder why. Why, why, why would they put that up there? Does anyone... Goals and directed learning. Yeah, goals and directed learning. Why, why would that be best practice? Actually see, to actually see if they know what they're selling or to actually know the product. Mm -hmm. Messages A and B plays by the A players that she wanted to achieve and then the results was the B players not struggling towards them. That's a big one. Yeah. B players tend to want to come to work and look like they're doing an awesome time. A players tend to want to absolutely own whatever they're doing. So it's very, very diagnostic, diagnostic of A players is that they want to do some sort of exam or certification. They want to demonstrate their mastery to themselves. It's something to think about. So we've talked about getting everyone all on board with the same systems and processes and about the merits of that. Let's have a chat now about the importance or not importance of providing people on your team with the same quality and quantity of substrate on which to achieve their results. So what we've got here is a picture of some of HubSpot's funnels. So they've got their ranking on the internet and that drives a certain amount of traffic, it gives them visitors and leads. They've got their blog, which drives visitors and leads. They've got the social media channels, which drive visitors and leads. And that gives them customers. So logically, if you had a team of three people and you had high quality, medium quality, and low quality leads, and you had a high quality performer, a medium quality performer, and a low quality performer, my logic says, Give the high quality performer the high quality leads. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Is that, it's not contentious, is it? No. Well, this is what Mark's saying is don't do that. Mark's saying give every person on your team exactly the same quality of leads. So he would say if you've got three players, give each of them one third of the high, medium quality and low quality leads. Why would he say that? <clears throat> I think because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you give shitty leads <clears throat> to someone, they get shitty results, then it just perpetuates. And also, doing it this way evens the playing field so you can sort A players from B players. Fairly. With, uh, yeah, fairly. Oh, I also think, I agree with that, but I also think that it will ass um, assist in training for the people that that might not be so good at it, but they're still A players. They're so, do you know what I mean? Like, that makes sense. They're still, they still fit the role and, and, and that, but they haven't maybe had quite as much experience where they can go up to the A player in the team or the person that's doing really successful in the team and go, how are you generating there? How are you turning these leads into a sale? And then they can actually learn from that as well. So even playing, even playing field is very illegal. You will get out and go away. Sorry, also too, I don't think you're giving too much of a challenge to the person that's in like the head. So if you're the best salesperson in that group and you're continuously getting good leads, you can continuously do good and that's just not going to be a challenge. And, and where if you give a bad lead to the person that's doing really, really well or like a, a not so great lead and they don't convert it, it brings that person back down to earth to going, hang on a second, I'm not invincible. So I think it gives them a chat, gives like the really good people a challenge as well. 
<coughs> Any thoughts from the east side? That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Any thoughts, Joe? I agree. Does cool. volume have to be different? Can, can volume be different and quality not? That's a really good question. What do people think? Can the volume be different? I would like, I still like to think based on that principle, I still like to give my salespeople the highest amount of leads. They're my best salespeople in the highest amount of leads um, because I want them to make the most possible amount of sales and then I'd decrease the lead if I'd decrease the leads of those not making the right, but like a high redemption rate because they're actually not achieving that, and so I just skew it from volume but not quality. That comes across to me as just being good business, good business practice. But what you more variables? Because it lacks more of a factor in. But you're trying to decrease every single variable to be a non variable. Yeah, but you're increasing the variables by giving them less quantity. But even with that, like. Because like is a high determining factor so over a short period. There could be a cap and a base, but with that base, like, I mean, you don't want to still. Keep involving the same as being efficient use of your best salespeople. You you increase the volume of the per, of the salesperson who's not doing that well when they start to succeed. You give them incentive to say, well, if you start succeeding at the low volume that you're getting now, we'll increase your volume. Increase it gives volume, them incentive to do. It gives them incentive to do well. And if you've got the right A player in the role, I'm just saying, if you've got the right person in the role anyway, they're going to want to succeed and they will continue to succeed. And then their amount of leads the amount of quantity you give them will increase. Scale retain is the base of that principle. I don't know. I see it invoking exactly the same problems as if you uh, segregate the quality determined upon how good they are. Because ultimately, if someone is not doing well in their job, you'd, like, you'd rather have them um, test that against the same level as people who are doing well, and then you can just fire them if they're failing. But what we, it depends what we're interested in, whether it's just a percent, like for example, on that, the, the, what makes sense to me is the KSI, the weekly metric you're measuring is, is conversion rate in sales, yeah? So, no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. If you've got someone who's not performing well, it doesn't make sense to scale back their things. It makes more sense to fire them. If, and, it make, and to actually know if they're not performing well, you have to give them the same quantity as the high performance because you're not going to know that until they've actually performed in their job. That's the, I agree with the fire principle, but I don't agree, like, for example, you're always going to have a rate of... But how are you going to know? Start, and the basic results you change. Yeah, you know, but if if you start from the start on the same playing field, you're going to have the same results. Yeah, but if if you start from the start on the same playing field, if you start from the start on the same playing field, and they don't perform, you get rid but, of them. But you're, you don't you're scale looking, back what they're doing. You're looking. You this is my opinion. I think you're looking at a little bit wrong in the fact that it, the the quality of the lead. So let's just say you're the best, you're second best, you're third best. You've got three, you've got six, you've got nine. It doesn't matter if he converts two. Yeah, his his percentage is lower than yours. It, that's not how like you're not looking. I I personally I'm not looking at the same way as you. Yeah, but I think if if you know that he's really good and he's pretty good and I'm shit, why don't you fire me? Yeah, but well, that's why I don't understand. Do you fire right? everyone who's at the best though, because they're yes. the best. Yes, that's that's the that principle because you're always going to someone who's better and your available resources yeah, may not convince actually have just the pure best. John, you're always going to have someone who's better. If they're only like a few percentage difference between them, that's fine. Obviously, there's someone that's a little bit better. But without making the like the playing field even, you're not going to know who is actually better than who. It could be like I could get like ninety percent conversion, I love to get eighty percent, and he gets you know sixty percent. You'd be like, all right, we fire him because you got sixty. And and the only way to tell yeah. like the variable is to have us all start at the same level. And if then after same, like a same quarter, quality, you know, same quality. no. But what I'm suggesting is if you start the same one, that's right. But then based on results. But after a quarter, if I have shown that I am thirty percent mm. worse than Joe, why and why do I still have okay, a job? So if Joe's a hundred out of makes hundred percent retention, Bilal eighty, he's six and uh, he's sixty. Yeah. I'm gonna get rid of Bilal's office than hundred. All right, and then no, you, you can say the last is acceptable. I want someone that gets at least yeah, seventy yeah. But yeah. why? But then the next quarter, wouldn't that scale? If, if I had, if I only had a hundred calls to make, mm-hmm. why would I want to give it equal playing for even playing for? Why would I want to give more to Joe? And that's but how do you know? Well, it depends how you measure it. Because what I'm saying, and yeah, you can give more. And what I'm saying is, you what you might do is give Bilal fifty percent of the amount of leads you're giving Joe, but at the same time, Bilal's still going to have the same success ratio for that fifty percent. He's still only going to get eighty percent of the fifty percent. So say that there's only three people in the world, and I hire three, and then I have to fire one of them. 
not going to fight all of them. It's just well, are you starting a sales team on Earth or on, <laughs> on, on, on a moon or on a base on the moon? Yeah, so I mean, I meant, to, I meant to create such a volatility in my sales department with people. You know, I think what you're, I think what you're suggesting actually encourages volatility because it's not an even playing field, and luck is more of a variable. I think you're looking at quantity as, a, as not being a, a, as a, not an even playing field. What, I think what, it's wrong because as long as you're getting the same quality of leads and same quality percentage of leads. Wait, hang on. I think what Anthony's saying though is if, if you start making the conversion rate that is in your key, is, a, is your uh, metric that you have to hit every week, why are you going to keep these keys flagging red? Rather decrease his volume, just fire him because he's not hitting his score. Okay, but he does a good job. He makes it, but Joe does twice a good job. I'm not going to give the same volume of calls to Anthony and I'm with Joe. I'm like, Joe, he's more. All right, so this is this is really good, and this this shows that this is not obvious. Yeah, what I want to ask you now to think about is the second f best performing tech company in the U.S. has eighty salespeople, and they're ranked from one to eighty every week. And every single one of those eighty salespeople gets exactly the same number and quality of leads, and they're doing better than everyone except for one other company. So they agree somehow with Anthony and Joe. How come they're doing better than all the other companies which are doing what you guys do? Which makes logical sense. Why would they be doing better? It's counterintuitive. It's like a science experiment. You can only measure with one variable. If you have too many variables in there, you're not isolating where the problem is. So I'd say it's more of a competitive thing. Because I think, like Sean is saying, I'm going to give all the leads to the person who does the best, but then that person might not be the best every single week. It's more egalitarian. It could be like that person, you know, someone died in the family, so they're not going to do as well, or whatever. Something could happen, or that person loses interest. Yeah, so we're keeping it, so we keep it, keep it even, keeping the play even, and then seeing who ranks every single week makes it more competitive and keeps people wanting to stay at the top. What? Yeah. Yeah. I know it sounds pretty simple and straightforward, but I'm looking at it from obviously just from this presentation alone, is that they've got 80 salespeople and they give the same amount of quality and quantity to those 80 salespeople is because they train those 80 salespeople exactly the same way for every 80 of them. So their confidence in the way that they're training their staff means that they, and the way they're hiring their staff to train them means that they're going to be as successful as number one to 80. That's the way I'm looking at it now after this presentation. It's a really good observation, is that because their management team and their systems and structures are so good, the difference between number 80 and number one on the list is not a huge amount. But also, as Anthony's pointed out, they don't carry people. They put them on for 13 weeks and they go gangbusters with training them and say, we need to have you up to this level in 13 weeks, otherwise it's not a match. And if it's not a match, that's our fault, not yours. And they really take that seriously. Now, has anyone played in a social sports team or a, you know, that sort of thing? So, you've got reserves on the bench. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're playing short. But when you do, who plays the shortest amount of time on the field? The worst person. The worst person, exactly. Now, let's compare that to a Premier League football team. So I'm talking about real football, not so Australian. Um, <laughs> got Ty's attention, that's good. Off your perch. Uh, <laughs> who plays the least amount of time in a Premier League football team? It depends on the situation. The situation yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if you're winning, you want to rest your superstar for the next week. If you're losing, you want to keep your superstar going. Yeah. This is something to think about. It's just like NFL football as well. They have different teams for different players. Different teams for different players. They sit there like for the majority of the game until it's their mm. time to shine. Yeah. Their it's and it's funny you say that because I've seen over in the last three years, AFL is starting to do the same thing. Mm. They're starting to learn. Mm -hmm. The whippet flow. <laughs> yeah. And this is something to really think about is that when you're running a team of B and C <laughs> players, social netball... You want to have the seest players on the court for the least amount of time. You can't really get rid of them. It's social netball. Yeah? <laughs> but when you're... What? No, you've, all been, you've, just... you've all played social sport. You know the person I'm talking about. It's me. Yeah? I used to play social basketball. I, like, we get two points a game. I'm social photo. What? 
<laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's, this is exactly right. Watch yeah? him. Yeah, this, but do, do you see the point I'm making? No. Yeah? But there's no noob lane. There's no carrying. There's no wing defence. You know, there's no back pocket in Premier League, yeah? So what you're saying, what you're basically saying is you just admitted that you're the last kid to get kicked every time at school. Yeah. Okay. I was too. Not a shame. Except, <laughs> except, in, except in drama class and home economics. <laughs> Got him. Should we call that a tie? Yeah, I'll give that Very one. good. Um, so, but the point that I'm making is to really have a think about when you're managing a team of A players, how they react and how they behave that's different for a team, from a team of B and C players. Think about Pro Dota. Who farms? The carry. Yeah? yeah? You want your best players facing the least amount of conflict quite often. But when you've got a team that's all A players, then what do you do? Oh, your role. You identify the, role. You identify the person. You know your team wrong. Yeah, exactly. And so this is what Mark's pointing out. And this is what he's trying to say is, if you need to divide up the quantity and quality of your leads, you're not a sales manager. You're a B player magnet for your company and you need to get out. I don't understand how that connects to identifying roles. Sorry? I don't, I don't understand how that connects to identifying roles. Well, here you're talking about a team that's more homogenous. Yeah? Where well, you're looking for a team with the same type of player. Yeah? Lots of the same so type it's of not player. Identifying roles. It's the opposite for identifying roles. And this is what he's saying is in a team that's diverse, the sort of approach that you're talking about is natural and it works. But in a team where you're trying to create a systematic structure that leverages a whole lot of people who are similar to achieve the same sort of result, this is what actually works. So this is actually the opposite of sports teams. Sorry? This is the opposite, the polar opposite of sports teams. Yes, exactly right. In sports teams, when they start at the lower level, they behave one way, and at the premier level, they behave the other. But in a team like this, where you've got every single person is playing at centre, the whole situation changes, Absolutely. and it's counterintuitive. In my hockey team, we have people that, when we get to the finals, that just sit penalties for us. They just pad up and they sit on the bench until we get a, a bench penalty. And they just go sit in the penalty and that's all they do. Mm. They don't even hit the ice. Yeah. They just they sit up penalties for us because we need our best players out there. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. And so this is the thing that Mark's pointing out is once you're dealing with a team of people, all of whom you're trying to train the same way, to get the same result and they're picking the same type of person, the skills and the logic that has served you in all of the other things that you've been doing working with diverse teams break down. Isn't this a pipe dream though for a kind of situation, Griffin? Mm. What? Joe? This is great. <laughs> I'm thinking about like a lot of the areas we're establishing though. Like, it doesn't seem like we have the resources actually to do this at such a high level. Like, to do this, you have to wipe people with DJ team and start from scratch, or at least identify those who don't want to create a hom hom like hom hom homogenous group who actually have a sense of the core values and strengths. So I don't think you have that. Maybe for sales, it might really be well, not necessarily the DJ group. The, the DJ group is everyone the same personality type? No. So are they homogenous in nature? That's a that's a group that's a group of people that's a group of people in my mind that you wouldn't want to have the same person. But then you but you but you, you split it up. You look at it, go. You want the homogenous people. You want three of the same type in the same venue who all work together. You yes. don't have the entire group doesn't have to be together. Yes. But each little sub department are DJs. Something I could be about that. I disagree. I think if you could find the like the one type of person who was just a superstar DJ and hosted the shit out of every room they went to. You would obviously want every DJ to be like you that. want that, but I mean, I'm talking about our specific uh, situation. And, and that might not well, the way I'd relate that to our situation is going forward, identifying what, uh, how we can actually screen for those types of people, and in future, just hiring them, and over time, the problem will fix itself. Yeah, and but you have that that's what I mean. I mean, the time, the time scale of this is just huge. Like, well, not no, not not, really. not, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. DJ's HubSpot was about our size about four years ago. It's still four years. DJing is a transient job. Four years. Like people, do it when, <laughs> people do it when they're in periods of transition. So, I mean, having said that, it's quite high turnover and we can easily implement this going forward. 
I'm thinking what we found five one of the right type people like today. We can train them up pretty fast. How sourcing how sourcing going for this kind of thing? I'm saying I'm saying I'm saying that's what Someone call the army and fill those sandbags up. Once that's sorted, I'm I'm saying hypothetically, once it's sorted and you you can rely on the correct people, eventually you can sort of stuff. For example, I had struggled with sourcing my sales roles. It's a shot of me as well. I didn't so I I struggled with source of sales and I ended up having not as many candidates that I wanted for my own for my own actions. So it's not a short of HR, it's a shot of me. No, 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 no. It's fine. But once again, I, I, I had six I, I had four roles to fill when I had seven people five from that. That's not acceptable. It's not enough people. What does top grading recommend if you want to fill, say, one role? How many people does it recommend you might be looking for in the source? Ten to one. Well, yeah. Is that one or more? Sometimes more. Depends. Yeah, it depends, exactly. It depends, but not two to one. Yeah, I failed at that. that that's why I shot when I was yeah. not sure so when I said sourcing for HR. I, I didn't source properly. Yeah, I would, I, I would I say your, the sourcing is the problem. Like, there's plenty of people out there looking for stuff to do. Hmm. So my experience was the job before the one I was working at the moment, they got a whole ream of paper of applicants hmm. that all were qualified. Ream of paper. There's people out there looking to do stuff. I and I would say that the, <laughs> the sourcing <laughs> leads. But also, like Dave says, the A players already have the jobs, so we've got to find where they are. Well, that's the other thing. Like, how many Bs and C players are carrying this company? What I'm trying to illustrate is there's so much. Like, I feel like we're trying to. Like, I look at my current sales team and it's like, all right, I understand where we're going. I did the best what I could. I haven't applied a lot of this, but we might be struggling with a few, in one or two areas of what I've actually tried to set up. And the fact that we're trying to integrate this at this level would be just. Intense, like it would take a lot of time. Hmm. And so I'm saying, is there? So I guess my my, my secondary question is: there a high level system that we start implementing as opposed to just, or do we need a high level? Or we do we do a well, what 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 I what I noted down as we were doing this was um, the actual quality of people we have in the HR pipe is actually quite ridiculous. Like there are some stupidly talented people in it, but it's more quantity. And what I said was that with respect, you can screen for core values to see if they generally fit in the company. But then you know how he had that list that was weighted of all those questions. Yeah. You could effectively score someone on an entire gamut of questions for every role in the company and then work out where they fit best on an operational level. Yeah. And that then gives you consistency in your departments. There's also the fact that we need to be more heavy about who we actually have in this current company and getting the hell out of their BNC folks. Because it doesn't have people come in culture and does, also does the team more than ever. More than ever. Well, are, they a, are, are they a C player overall or are they a C player in the, in the role you put them in? Or so whoever puts them, I'm not honest, saying you personally, but I really. think B players and mainly B players might get one or two A categories, but you're going to be pushing for it. C players are going to really struggle in any A category. There's underlying principles for me, and I probably will, but for me, I see that again and again. You roll the dice on these people so many times, you just put them through again and again. It's just getting mm. right. And we know who those people are, can't we? We can identify, you know, you make a list, but. Well, my point is, like, is this going to work? We're we really going to have to overhaul a lot of things. We're going to start from scratch. We're just trying to work it in. We we'll work it in. It's a slow process. There's a way to rank people in that role against other people. But, like, would you feel comfortable with this? I think, I think being more honest about, um, you know, keeping people on. So, I mean, you know, um, I did let someone go, like, the other month who yeah. was not a core value match. And I, I would sort of be, you know, um, I would encourage the other like managers and execs to be able to like make the same decision, have the same conversations. It's not fun like firing people, but you know. I fired my whole exec team pretty much. And it wasn't as unfun as I thought it was going to be because most of them, because I did it in a good way, I helped them find other jobs which were a better match for them because I could see that they were not a match for this company. You know? Some of them hated me for a couple of months, but a lot of them now I think can see that what I really did was freed up their future. But I think it's how you go about that. Mm. You know, I didn't just go, oh, you're a C player, get out of my company. I went, wow, I think that I might be stuffing up your future. And this is why. And this is the evidence that I have because it's not happening. But I know that you're talented at these things. Who, how can I help you get a job that's a match? And then they would say what they had to say. And then I would say, I need you to help me. I need you to find people out there that are a match for the role that you're leaving or for this company and show me who they are. Would you help me with that? It's about, it's about being honest in that communication, but at the moment, sometimes we're not. We're giving people false hope where 
They've got no chance of ever coming into this company or progressing in this company, but we're still giving the pipe in that they could potentially be in it, just for the sake of keeping all those investors potentially. Mm. Yeah. Did you see what I had? Also, to point out something out as well, for most of those people, if they actually were awesome ambassadors, they would probably fit in our company too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm not trying to be like, I know what I said for a lot of them wrong, I'm just trying to get the point of, I'm struggling to comprehend the level of how we can interact with at a direct point right yeah. now. So what's just dramatic about it? We'll be fine. Yeah, it's fine. Right. This is, remember, this is MIT level best practice. Yeah? yeah I don't, I don't this is, you know, the companies that do this become not pretty good. They become like second in the United States and stuff. So I'm not saying that this is easy, but I'm saying that I think this is something that's worth going for. Mm. Also, remember, they didn't get to the number two spot by being perfect. They got to the number two spot by making a commitment to be better every quarter. Yeah. You know, we talked last session about the eight levers of business and the difference it can make by shifting each of those levers just by 1% or one day every quarter can give you 60% in your growth. And this is what we're talking about. You know, every change that you make to be more in alignment with best practice is going to make a difference. And every time you shirk out of an opportunity or you're not willing to make a change, we don't move forward. Why do we... Sorry, so I'm doing a side question. Why do we advertise position and performance? What do you mean? Why do you ask that question? Because it just seems like we're... It recycles people, but that's sometimes... Are we recycling... Are they the type of people want to be recycling? Nah, well, because you might be moving someone, like if someone applies for a role, it might be one that they're more suited for. I remember what Sean was saying there, saying we should try and move away from the way we're doing things now and try and change up. So oh, yeah, no, no, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, well, like, we, 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 we cycle too much internally. Generally, people who reapply again and again positions because they're not getting other positions of being C players. And the people we're eventually putting into roles are getting pulled into the roles instead of pushed into the role. Mm. This seems like it's an outbound method of, of HR as opposed to an inbound method, which is what this is showing is that referrals and inbound, like, there's a company we to learn to take on new people. Well, we do, we do have inbound HR now. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is not if, we, if, we didn't, if we didn't have some form of inbound HR, we wouldn't have Ty Baxter, we wouldn't have Josh Smith, you yeah. know, we wouldn't have yeah. Irene. Yeah. I was going to say, we wouldn't Josh actually really have Bill. example of him being pulled into a position as opposed to pushing to Exactly. Position. So I'm saying, why are we using some traditional method and getting people's whole hopes up and false sense of like, actually, if you play this issue, you might actually get it. Because let's be honest, even top grade, you know who's going to get pulled in positions and who's not just in based application as well. Hmm. So like, it just seems like we're kind of stuck in the middle between two systems and we're not really moving on the other. We're trying to work on the other, but not doing that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with using both. Specifically, like, again, for the reason that I said, which is someone might be an A player in one role, whereas they're a B player in another. I mean... And every position I have come into a group that I've been pulled into or at least recommended to apply for or chatted to about applying for. Mm. No, no, I haven't seen a position from a door. I really want that apply for and go. Yeah, I suppose Someone's that's always the... chatted to me. I'm pretty sure we go around the table. Mm. Who's, who's the five position out of just bluntly wanting to get it and then apply go? Like, I know you've been pulled into inbound, pulled into function sales, pulled into, pulled into functions to sales as well. You've been forced into HR. <laughs> 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 yeah, <we're close. laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. Mitch, Mitch Mitch, everyone's been pulled, so why would you I'd, I'd push, push back on you with that. How do you mean? That's us pulling you the hell out. You, you seem to say yes. But then you and, you're not, and you're not easily led. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? You don't say yes to things if you're not actually going to do them. Yeah, that's why. Yeah? You are quite emo, but you're not like impressionable. <laughs> 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 it's not this week. Kidding ourselves with some with some of our current structures. It's, it just seems so contradictory to what this is what's going up here. Yeah, and I think it's really great that you raise it. Yeah, absolutely. This is why we have these sessions because yeah. Mark's pointing out that some of the things that we're doing right now don't align with the best practice for a company that's expecting to get somewhere. When you said that though, I mean, most people how they came to the company isn't it growing about matter. Josh met, would have met Jess through me, and then that's how he came to the company. But it's still no. pulled. Like, Dave. I, mean, I got pulled in by Vic, Joe got pulled in by Vic, um, you were in by Evan, I guess. Yeah. So, isn't that part of the like, 
Yeah, yeah in referrals. Yeah, referrals. Yeah. Referrals. Yeah. Inbounds, not outbound. Yeah. Referrals is to inbound because they identify people you have incoming yeah. inside. That's, that's that, I'm telling you, they are doing that, but I think mm-hmm. you're just, yeah. yeah. What I'm saying is we're still using such outbound things and transparency on forums and all this other crap. It's just being seen by these cool complaining because they're constantly not getting rocks. That pisses me off. And I don't understand why. And they all know that. But the only reason I think we advertise on the front is to, is to keep it fair, to say that this is what we're trying to do and give people off. So my question but is, but is that fair or are unfair to the people that aren't consistently getting roles because they're useless and they don't see that? Bluntly. It's, it's, un, it's unfair in the sense I think we're giving the false hope again. But if they're not going to keep getting these roles, then the are possibly should be getting moved on. Hmm. Especially if they can't keep a role down. I'm, I'm going over the top, by the way. I'm going to spit. No, I'm, 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 I'm just trying to think, yeah. And sorry to be away from the learning more of a general company discussion. This is not a sales presentation. I said that at the start. Exactly what you're talking about now is exactly what we came here to talk about. This is spot on. Yeah? You're really starting to think deeply about the concepts around how you put a team together and how you set people up to win. This is the main area where managers add leverage. You know, our overheads at the moment are 42%. And their value added by myself and the rest of the executive team is questionable let alone quantifiable. <laughs> you know, we're not getting a lot back for our 42%. <laughs> so this is very relevant because, you know, people complain, you know, the CEO of, how much does the CEO of um, Commonwealth Bank get paid? He just got a pay cut to like 8.6 million or something. Boo-hoo. Oh, what a poor bastard. Yeah. yeah Why does he get paid, you know, $8 million or something a year? Because they're dumbasses and generates results. Generates results. Did you see PwC's um, did you see Price Waterhouse Cooper's current um, return? The that end of year report just came out about the profit levels. Twenty seven billion. Because they have no assets. It's all human. Right in a financial crisis on a consulting basis, please. Like, hmm. I just know exactly how. I hope at least a billion their CEO would get from that. Yeah, and this is because they know some of these things, and not only do they know them. They're willing to take the steps which move a company from here to there. They're just willing to do it. They know it and they're willing to do it. And this is why we're having the conversation, so that at least you know it. And then we find out who's willing to do it and who wants to be nice and have everyone as their best friend and be well-liked. Has anyone seen The Death of a Salesman? Good play. (laughs) How did you get in the company? Um, no, since you're happy. Right. But then again, no, I haven't, we're had, like, we have these other gay conversations that people like DT and Dan should pop up and say, but I came to come through university. Why are we using these archaic methods to, to do this? Why, why is it this post? I, how did you get about that poster? The poster is done. He's <laughs> 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 saying point, the poster is done. How did you get about that when that's an archaic method of marketing? We shouldn't use No, but we, it depends how you use that poster. We use that that's poster. Because that the other thing is, if you want to go around and stick up at university. No, but like, the thing is, my plan, I'm taking it to Office Works tomorrow. We're going to have it on all the cashier's drawers and stuff. So the people walking through the lines, you know. That's a much better thing about it. It's the part of the But what was being suggested is that many after that many go around the university and put it on walls. But that's not, you know, but then again, you find different people at uni. Then you scream them. And, and it is still technically inbound. If you put it up on a job board, who's going to go look at a job board? Someone who wants a job. 50,000 people from Odes. What? <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're saying is true, but I think... Uh, I'm, I'm just showing you out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you make a very valid point. Day, day. So Can you understand now why I really encourage site coordinators to bring their ambassadors to Monday night dinner? Mm. Mm. How many boo ambassadors do we have just quietly? Too many. Well, one of the guys. No, I, I, dis- I completely disagree. Yeah, I think we have a lot of boot addicts. That's good. Point. Yeah, <laughs> they don't bring anyone. Yeah, true, yeah. they bring someone one week and then they make friends with us and then they stop bringing people and hanging around. Two guys, flashback between the Duke of Liverpool, one's tall, weird, wears a vest and his black shirt, the other one's this blonde haired guy. I know you're talking about Toby and um. So we've we've got some deeper conversation out here, yeah, and we've really started to realise that. Maybe some of this counterintuitive stuff that Mark Roberge is saying could be the case, but maybe if we were going to implement this, we need to maybe have a look a little bit deeper at the things that we've got systematically ingrained in the company and really start to think about how we're structuring this thing. Mm. This is the difference between executives and frontline workers and 
managers that stay middle management and get frustrated for 30 years. Yeah? Some people are willing to think about this and have this conversation and learn about it and then do it badly for a little while while they get good at it. And some people just aren't willing to do that. I know that you are because this is a non-compulsory learning session. So here's something which is really, really important that, that I didn't really understand the importance of until I started implementing. Um, Mark really made a point of saying, once you've done all this, you've got to hold marketing accountable for lead quality and quantity. What's that about? What, what's the wider point that he's trying to make here when he says, okay, if you're going to hold all of your sales staff exactly equal, then why would it be important? Why does he then immediately go to this slide and say, if you're going to hold your sales staff accountable for having everything clear and equal, then why would you hold marketing who feed you the leads accountable for lead quality and quantity? Why is he saying this? He's trying to make a point here. It's job to generate the leads, their job to convert those leads. It's unfair to them to blame if you get... Just continue to shoot leads. Yeah. Like if, we, if I keep handballing um, boots to Anthony to, to hire and they don't, they don't meet the A play method and they don't get in, that's not his fault. That's my fault for giving shit leads. Mm -hmm. I should be sourcing though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatically put below. <laughs> but he's, he's only using it as an example because we were talking about that. Yeah, I know. You can't, you what can't, else do people think? You can't give a salesperson a lead for someone that wants to hire a sound system to someone that's wanting a function, if that makes sense. So you can't so you can't give a lead to the function sales guy, but he doesn't even want that product. So it, they have to want the product to start with. So if you're marketing and your your screening's not correct, you you hand them over dud leads. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. And the quality of good leads obviously means it's gonna be a higher percentage of turnover, like a higher we had, we had a guy knock around the door today and say, who's selling delivered milk, bread, and other basic goods. I was walking out to my car and I'm like, man, that guy's life sucks. I've done that before. Yeah, but I'll take two litres of bread, two litres of milk. <laughs> yeah, but, but seriously, like, that's like, people burn out with that as well. I think you're producing bad leads, your sales, your sales guns are like, not in that either. I agree, yeah. Some cold oh. calling, like, if you get a cold calling mm. sales rep, the whole system's retarded to start with. Like, they're only doing what and they can do. And if they're out of the they're not going to hang So, let's have a think about what happens with a sales team. Yeah, you've got a sales team and you've got a few guns and you've got some noobs and they're like following the guns around and they're working the leads together and the guns get drunk on the weekends and stuff and they're pretty cool and the noobs look up to them and that sort of stuff. Now, when your sales go down, what do your sales team say? You say, we're not selling as much as we were before. What's gone wrong? What do they say? Leads. Our leads are worse. Yeah. yeah. And you go to marketing and you say, our leads have got worse. What do marketing say? Sales aren't selling. Yeah. So this is the point that Mark Reberge is trying to make, is if you have a sales pipe and system where every single person is the same and is trained the same way and is given the same quality of leads, then you have an objective measure of how good the leads are and whether they're getting better or worse. Because you're taking new people into your sales team that are a match and then you're mapping how fast they grow. And you'll actually be able to form a very, very good data set about conversion ratios of leads. But if you're all over the place and you don't have a systematic team, you're never ever gonna be able to generate that data. And the reason Mark talks about this straight afterwards is he believes that one of the main reasons for success of the sales team in HubSpot is because they're so systematic and they have good clear data, they can push back on marketing systematically for better leads, which 99% of sales teams can never do. It's always just that ongoing argument, sales is crap, marketing is crap, sales is crap, marketing is crap, yeah? which is 99% of companies out there. And no one can ever really get honest about whether the sales team just got crapper or the marketing team just got crapper. But if you have a sales team which is systematically structured like, the, like Mark's is, then you've got the data. And you can see and you can show that your marketing team is robust and they're getting better. And then you can push back on marketing and say, this is precisely how good your leads were three months ago and this is precisely how good they are now because our team is balanced and stable. 
And that's something that 99% of sales execs can never, ever do. Can marketing push back conversely? Absolutely, they can. But fortunately for you, you're an A-player sales manager. If you're not, then exactly the thing you're going to want to do is create a fiddly sales team, which is not objective. Yeah? This is why you know most B-player sales managers stay there. Yeah, because they structure their teams to be all higgledy-piggledy and not quantifiable. But A-player sales managers don't. They lock down the variables because they know they're an A-player sales manager. And they provide data to support the fact that they're an A-player manager from the success of their team. And they go in and get their almost always B-player or C-player marketing manager who's just fluffing around in the <coughs> ground talking about their general ratings and not actually locking down any leads and not taking any objective data. And they force marketing to become objective. But there's only one way to do that, and that's by systematizing your team and your metrics first. But once you've done that, you can do this. And this is what he was able to do. Can you see what he's done here? What's this graph? Looks to me like obviously the green is marketing, yeah. purple is sales, and obviously the red line is the goal that they're aiming for. And it looks like they had a dip around 2021, possibly because the leads coming through might have been bad. Hmm. It just clearly shows how many leads to how many sales conversions are there. You're actually showing it better because like the amount of leads that they're receiving at the beginning, at the very beginning there, one to two, three, hmm. is very high. And the conversion is is shit is shit because the leads are shit, hmm. and then as time goes on, they're actually steady coming apart. So they're actually why well, the conversion's getting better because the leads are getting better. That's yeah. what it looks like to me. Anyway. Yeah. So what Mark's trying to point out is once you've got a systematic team, you can force marketing to get honest and systematic as well, and then you can grow your volume. But until you've actually got a systematic team structure and you force marketing to become systematic as well, you can't really grow the volume very safely. Is HubSpot just blogs? They're mainly SEO. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're trying to help you figure out how to develop more leads using the internet. Yeah. Is that fair, Bella? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, getting and converting more leads. Now... This is the next thing he talked about, which is good sales managers and good sales people are scientists as much as sales people these days. He's just shown us this cool graph. And what they did was they actually measured how many times they rang someone and how likely that person was to convert to a sale, which is kind of cool. So you're wondering about how many steps to have in your sales pipe, or your delivery pipe in operations, or your inbound pipe? Well, they didn't wonder. They used science. <laughs> and they just measured, they just looked at converted leads <coughs> and said, okay, let's look at all the converted leads and just measure how many times we called those people. And they just plotted it on a graph here. 14 they, times. Yeah, yeah. 14 times to the uh, Yeah. Oh, I don't know. But what they found was really, really interesting, which was if you call someone three times, they might buy something. If you call someone five times, they'll probably buy something. If you call someone seven times, they're really, really likely to buy. But once you've called them more than seven times, they become less and less likely to buy. And what this allowed them to do... <laughs> what this allowed... Them, this is not just phone calls. This is email communications or this is how many communications you had with this person. How many points of customer contact? Um, but what they, this allowed them to do was actually systematically measure how much it costs to ring someone or contact them and then find an optimal point about how many times on average you want to contact someone. What's the optimal point of cost to redemption? And what they found was, you know, if you really just want to maximize redemption, you want to be calling people around about six or seven times. But the peak of where you get the most growth in calls is around about five times. So aiming for a customer process, which has about five steps in it. 
because that's where you get the most growth is in the second, third, and fourth steps so for is, our product. This is always in, in the case how many employees to have making this amount of interactions. No, no, this is how many employees were in the com in the business that they were calling. Yeah, so you can see for a small business, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, okay. yeah. For, whereas for a big business, more calls was more effective. For for a small business, yeah, and so depending on what type of customer you're calling. You know, if we're just ringing some small businesses or some owner operators, we're just going to call them once or twice, and they want it or they don't. Yeah. Yeah, but you notice exactly that the bigger the company, the more points of contact that you need, the more times you've got to bug them. Hmm. So this is just his. The, the thing he's trying to point out here is, don't think that you can't find out more about how to optimize your sales process or your operational process. There's a lot of data out there that you've got. You know, I just spent the last four weeks calling 100 people a week so I can find out the optimum point of birthday uptake for functions. Find out whether calling, you know, we just assume that calling someone three months in advance is the best time to call someone when they're most sensitive and likely to want a DJ. But I've got bad news. I've got good news. It's not. And it only took me four weeks to figure that out. Because I got better redemption with the calls that were about six to eight weeks than I did the 12, uh, 12 week, 13 week in advance calls. That data's always been available to us. No one really bothered to just check before. So, you know, we're getting this whole team together of people to call people three months in advance to try and sell them a function. And yet, that may not be the best time to call. We could double their redemption rate by getting them to do exactly the same work six weeks later in the process. Maybe. Science will tell us if we're willing to go out there and have a look. We've got the data. We're just not processing it. Do you have the budget? Sorry? Do you have the budget to do it as well? Mm, yeah, that took, me, that took me eight hours of calls to do. And I was doing the calls anyway. So if you think you don't have the budget for it, I think you're just not being creative enough. So I think we do. Hmm. I'm sorry, that, that test, that <laughs> test, to do that test cost no more, yeah. yeah, than what I was already doing, yeah, it's just how you gather the data, it took me about five minutes to gather the data, do you know what I mean, yeah. these things do not take big budget, hmm. they can if you want, you can get some independent company to come in and charge you a whole lot of money to do this analysis, or oh, you yes. can, yeah. or you can an analyse the data that you've already got there. You know? Imagine if we went back and looked at every single redemption every week from every nightclub and said, where did that come from and where are we getting the best redemption and what processes? And we've got this information there if we're willing to go and mine it. You know? Do two week calls, do, we, do calls two weeks in advance work better than calls on the week? You know? Does it work better to call on Monday or Tuesday? Or between five and seven or seven and nine? These are all things we can find out the answers to if we're willing to go out and have a look. We don't need 10,000 data points either. This is not, we're not publishing a scientific paper here. Any data is good data. That's the only point he was trying to make there, is be aware that there's a lot of info there. So the next thing Mark was really keen to talk to us about was holding sales accountable to attempt quantity and quality. So what's, what's that talking about? Who's worked in call centre here before, doing calls? You know when we give someone calls to do and they come up and they give us a sheet full of DCs? Yeah. Yeah? What happens? <clears throat> You're like, double check to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> this is all he's talking about. Yeah. It's basics, but a lot of people forget to do it. Yeah. Is to actually set some par levels around what you would expect a conversion rate to be and give people something to aim for. So that you can see when someone is disenfranchised or when someone doesn't have the appropriate training and needs some help or when there's something going on in the market and you haven't realised it or when someone's just not, simply not doing work. So if I push back on, I'm thinking a niche to say, get redemption, let's yeah. see the redemption. Yeah, exactly. Based on redemption as well. Yeah. Without that check and balance of actually checking redemption on the front line, there's no way of knowing who's not doing the work, who doesn't know how to do the work, where your systems are crap or where the market's changing. 
This is very, very important to be able to track this. Because if you can't see where the system is breaking down in the pipe, you can't treat it. This is why I rave on and on about pipes and try and break things down into sections and pipes. Because if you can see where the pipe's broken, you can just fix that part. So can you see this graph at the bottom? This is pretty cool. This is tracking for different workable lead groups in the last five weeks, how they, they were converted. So open, in progress, qualified, unable to qualify, unqualified. Can you see the, the change in variance there? Huge variance in this part of their lead pipe week to week. Really, really interesting data for them. And not that hard to create pictures like that. And this is the final main thing that we're going to have a look at, which is have salespeople work the leads with the same process. So here's the process that they've been using at HubSpot. This is not to say that it's the right process, but they know that the optimal point for them is about five or six con contact points. So they've got five or six there. And so they do research, prospect the customer, connect, qualify, do a demo, and then get objections and close. That's their process. So why do we have the salespeople work the leads with the same process? Why do we do that? Why is Mark proposing that we do that? Why don't we just let people just do what naturally works for them and just be a natural salesperson and just sell the way that works for them? Thoughts? Comments? Feelings? You can see where it breaks down now. If um, a salesperson can't get money, you can't demo, just value the software and continue to switch, keeps breaking down at the same point, you know that's where they are, they're not trained well enough or they'll never be a fit. Yeah. People come to me and say, I can't sell stuff, help me. And I'll be like, where in the processes of breaking down? And they're like, well, I can't get people to buy my stuff. <laughs> and we're like, no shit. Where in the processes of breaking down? Yeah? I break down between qualify and demo. That's where people flake for me. I qualify leads really, really well, and then they flake between qualify and demo. But if I get someone to demo, I've got to say and I can get a lot, a lot of people through, like research, prospect, connect, and qualify. Have you um, established what the problem is between qualify and demo? Then? What your personal problem is? Not particularly, hmm. but I know where the problem is, and that's what I'm. I'm not. I don't think I can't sell. Yeah. Hmm. I think I have a breakdown in the way that I qualify people, and that's what I'm looking at is the qualifying process and how I do that. I'm experimenting with all different ways of qualifying people. I am not changing a thing about my connection conversation. I'm not changing a thing about that. Every change that I make every week is around how I qualify people. Every week I do it differently. Because I know that's where I break down in the process because I've got a very, very clear pipe for the way that I do my sales. And I can see where it breaks down. Can you explain qualify a little bit more? What is that? So it's, it's what it says there. It determines worthiness for a demo. So is this person actually really keen to buy? Okay. Yeah, so I'm... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not very, very good at qualifying people that way, really telling the difference between a person who wants to buy or not. You know, to be perfectly honest, I don't know whether how good or bad I am at it because I don't have anyone else in my team that's using the same process as me to compare to. So I might actually be quite good at it. It might just be a low rate for our industry. I don't know because I have nothing to compare it to. It would be really nice if I did. You must, must connect that with like late level kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, just connect with the person and actually get them in line to actually have the conversation around whether they want to buy it or not. But remember, this is just their steps, yeah? yeah. You know, you use sand or sales methodology and the whole, all the steps are completely different. But the methodology that Mark's saying is the same is figure out the optimums for different things, time of call, when you call, how many times you call, figure out those things, optimise those, and then have a process. So that whatever process and whatever methodology of sales you're using, if it breaks down for someone, you can see where. Otherwise, all you're just doing is yelling at people to sell more stuff. So, but, but why do they're saying have the sales people work the leads with the same process? Why get everyone to do it exactly the same way? It's a good way of measuring if it's, if it's a problem system or a problem person. Correct. Spot on. If it's a problem with the system, everyone's going to find. Exactly. If it's a problem with the person, and those people are going to find. Exactly. 
This is the problem that I have at the moment is I don't know whether my problem is a system problem or a me problem because I don't have any comparative data. You know, like I think I'm pretty good with connecting, but maybe the connect rate for other people would be 100%, not 90. <laughs> yeah? Maybe I'm actually crap at connecting. I don't know because I don't have any objective data to compare against. This is really, really important for you to think about and not just in sales. You know, par levels, Joe. Yeah. This is exactly the same thing. Egress per venue. Egress per venue. You know, how can you tell a DJ that they're, you know, making people leave if there's no comparison to another venue? It's exactly the same concept. It's not just for sales. This is for anywhere. If there's no comparative measure, then people have nothing to go against and to aim for. And secondly, you have no means to give them feedback or to give them a thirst for learning or anything about stepping up because there's no measure or comparison. But if you can sit down with someone and say, hey, the average person off the street is twice as likely to close the sale as you are, then that gives them something to focus on. It's not an attack on them, it's, it's the data. And you can point that out to them. You can also point out to them and say, hey, you qualify people a lot well, a lot better than most. You know, you can break it down a bit. So this is a pipe. So the way to look at this is, and this is how the guys at HubSpot compare. So you're a color. You've got a color when you join the team. You get given a color. And so every week they have a look and go, okay, how many leads did you create? How many leads did you work? How many demos did you deliver? How many units were created out of that? What was the yield? And what were your percentages? Starts to be purple. Green's pretty good. Green's awesome. Hmm. The brown one, does that just mean they delivered the demo to the same people? Over and over, they've got more demos delivered than leads created. <laughs> so, is that what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Did you see? Did like... you see they had a thing called recapture in this? No. I didn't yeah. see that. They have a thing called recapture where they move people back through the process oh, and they turn them back into the process. Yeah. yeah. They don't lose leads at HubSpot. Yeah. Yeah. So this is about implementing a metrics-driven sales culture. Yeah. Every point of the pipe is mapped for every person. There's no wriggling around. There's just some really interesting combos of going, wow, you know, purple, you're amazing. You're a rainmaker. You know, you just bring so many leads into this company. And then something goes horribly wrong. And saying to Green, wow, you know, you're performing really solidly in all the different areas. You've got a, you're a well-rounded salesperson. What is it that you're doing in each different, in each different area? But also saying to Green, well, actually, you're pretty awesome overall, but you could actually lift because pink and brown both deliver more demos than you. So you might think that you're awesome, but you're just solid. And you could actually still grow a lot more, even though you're the number one member in our team, if you actually took more on board just, from these two people. Just generate more leads. But if he could get his demos delivered up to where brown is, yeah. then his units would go up by like 33% and these guys are working on commission. True. So, you know, 33% pay rise for no more work? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. So does this give you some ideas? Some. So negative. Now, this is the next thing that he looked at, which was to peel back the onion. So don't be shy to dig a little bit deeper with your data. So he took this data of the lead, the work lead to demo percent, and he actually broke it down and actually looked at it in more detail, and he actually found that between two different people, the picture was very, very different. So that's something to think about as well. That is, is it in direct correlation with one of the colors, each one? Yeah, yeah. So you can see the lead work to connect ratio was very, very stable. 
from quarter to quarter, but the connect to demo ratio was hugely variable. And this taught them something really, really interesting about how robust their systems and trainings were at different parts in their pipe. So what they learned was they were really, really good at connecting with their leads. But getting demos, their, method, their sales methodology in that area was obviously not stable. It was not methodical. It was not universal. It was some quarters it was working you know, really, really well with some teams and other teams were just not getting it. So you dig a little bit deeper, you can find some really, really interesting things. Could it have been in the demo itself or not necessarily? It could have been, yeah. yeah. Could, yeah. yeah. They knew to look because they saw that and went, the way that we're doing this is not working. Is it because it wasn't consistent? Well, with their demos, actually, for some people it's really easy to implement. For other people, you've got to put like, this code on your website. And for some people, that might be really hard to do. And they'll be like, oh, I can't be fast. But is it because the, the data is consistent? Like in the first one, data is mm. consistent. That mean, does that mean there's no problem? Not necessarily even exactly. You've pointed out something else yeah. there. It doesn't mean there's no problem, but it means it's stable. Okay. Hmm. Whereas this one was very volatile. Okay. So he was just pointing out if you look deeper in the data, sometimes when you think that you've got something that's really, really stable, you might actually learn that it's not. So the next thing that he went to do was talk about compensation plans. And I just wanted to just give you this as an idea about that there's not just one way to compensate people. And this is I'm just going to give to you to think about. So this was the first compensation plan they had. 500 bucks per customer, double commission um, on any sales above the quota. So that, you know they have to get a base number of sales for the quota. Anything above that, they got double commission. Um, and they had a four month clawback. So if anyone pulled out of the sale within the first four months, then they had to give the money back. Well, they didn't have to actually pay it back, but they got a little flag there, which meant, you know, the next two customers we're not going to pay you for, or whatever. And that worked. And then they tried this one. So they looked at long-term value of the client. Um, so depending on how long your customers stayed in the business, you got paid a different amount per customer. So they, this was a combination of long and short-term for the salespeople. So every month they would measure what tier you were in. So you were, they had 80 people and they were just 20 people in each tier. And so if you were in the top tier and your customers were staying for the longest, you got four times as much for your customers as the people in the bottom tier because you were bringing long-term value to the company. And that worked for a while. And then they did a bit of a combination, which was you get half in the first month, you get another quarter when they're in at six months, and then at 12 months, you get um, another 25%. So we're going to give you your money, but it's staged over time. Also, if you're over quota, we're going to give you double, and we're going to have a six-month clawback. So if people don't stay with the business for six months, you don't get nothing. All of these worked. They're different reward structures. The first one worked really, really well when the business was first being created because they just needed customers. The second one really, really worked in the middle of the business because they, they had a lot of customers, but they were losing them. And the third one worked really, really well in the long term because in the long term, they needed a balance between retention and getting new customers. And that's the system they still use today. So I'm going to rush through this because we're, we're pretty much at time, um, but we've covered all the four major points. So I'm really comfortable with what we've, we've talked about today. Um, the frontline manager is the key role. So they're talking about the duties. So Mark believes that this is the duties of a sales manager, is to coach, motivate, hold accountable, and recruit. And he contrasts this with what he sees at most companies, which is they keep the forecasts up to date to keep upper management quiet. They close the big deals to bring in the big bucks and be the big guy that closes the big deals. Um, so that they can show that they're irreplaceable and a, and a big guy. And they manage reps through fear. And say, so make your sales, otherwise I'm going to have to let you go. Right. <laughs> and he just said, look, this is not best practice. People that manage that way, they do okay, and that's a lot of companies do it that way. But if you want to get to number two in the, you know, in the most competitive market, in the most competitive country in an industry, this is what's going to get you there. You've got to coach people. You've got to diagnose issues, identify the strategies, and then hold people accountable. 
And you can't do that unless you have a stabilized team. And you can't do that unless you've brought in A players. You need to motivate people. You need to understand their goals and you need to create ways and plans of meeting those goals. Things that actually create real activity in the real world. You've got to hold people accountable. And the thing that he stressed time and time again, you've got to automate it with dashboards. And you've got to have it be fair and equal and transparent amongst every member of the team. Otherwise, you are forever dealing with this is not fair and placating and favouring and no, no, no. He said, you just go crazy. You can't be a sane manager if you don't have fair, even accountability systems in, 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 in your teams. And the final one, and this is the one that he really focused back in on the end, was recruit. You know, He said, I don't require HR to recruit for me. HR bring me plenty of A players. But what really creates my team is the A players that me and my team bring in. You know, HR bring me plenty of peeps. And we've got HR has brought us plenty of great peeps. But what's made the difference for my team is that on top of all of that, I recruit and all of my staff recruit. Because they're A players and they want to have A players in the team. And he stressed that there's no end to the responsibility of the manager to bring in A players. He said, when the manager brings in an A player, the effect on the team is phenomenal. When HR brings in an A player, that's just business. But when the sales manager brings in an A player, it has an impact, a human impact. That is not to be underestimated. Now, this is something that Sean mentioned a little bit before. Um, what do you do, though? You don't want to be in you know, China and have 10,000 people that are all doing exactly the same thing and then you don't know how to innovate. So he said, you know, once you've got this stabilised and you're doing well, the first thing you want to do as soon as you've got your base structure in your team stabilised is you want to start experimenting. But he said how you do this is very, very important. So, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't, I took all the content out because I just wanted to talk about this. Um, when you experiment... It's got to be done in a laboratory because what happens when you experiment? Shit goes wrong. Things blow up. So don't do your experimentation in your core team. Start project teams and experiment there. So he was very, very clear. He said at HubSpot, we do a lot of experimentation and he showed us all these innovations they'd made in the last six months from their experimental teams that they put out doing experimental projects. But he said, none of this stuff happens in my core team. We've got 80 salespeople out there going bananas with best practice. And then we've got half a dozen people that go out and experiment with stuff. And when they bring back best practice, then we put it into the teams after we've exploded it a few times that made it safe for human consumption. So definitely experiment, but do it in a laboratory, not in your house. And this is the final question. It's just a bit of a thought experiment for you guys before we go. This was the short thing that Sean was talking about is how the heck do you start? Because you don't start with 80 people. You start with one person in your sales team or in your DJ crew or in HR or wherever. You, know, you might only be looking for one person. So if you were going to become like HubSpot in four years' time and you were actually going to get the second best in the country, where would you start if you were going to hire your first salesperson with the end goal of being the best company in Australia? Who would your first person be? Would it be the guy in the top left, a very experienced industry person who's currently a VP who supervises a team that creates over 200 million in sales? Would it be a vaguely androgynous entrepreneur um, in your industry with a sales background? Um, would it be the number one sales rep out of 500 reps, not in your industry, but with five years absolute gun experience? Or would it be a 10 years sales experience person in your industry who was recently promoted to a sales manager role? Who would you pick? Ty, you seem to have an opinion. It's, well, the guy on the bottom left, I want to smack him out. He looks like a dick. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't know why but I'm pulled to the entrepreneur yeah why do you say that because a good if, let's just say I assume that he's good obviously good I know it sounds stupid or a good entrepreneur but they take risks and they'll, they'll do things and they'll, they're open minded to, to new which obviously best practice as in what you are doing 
then you're an entrepreneur. So I'm looking at I'm looking at it from that perspective. That's that's how I, especially a new company. That's all I'm thinking I would look at because so you got someone to invest in. The company. Situation, yeah. So if you were going to start your sales team from scratch right now, who would you sales first? Manager, yeah, yeah. Who would you? Yeah, who would your sales manager be? Who would you choose as your sales manager? I reckon the guy at the bottom left. Yeah, and why? There's no wrong answer here, by the way. This is not a test. I don't know the answer. Well, because like I agree. I, I thought at first the entrepreneur as well. But the thing is, you kind of want someone who's going to be able to build a consistent team around. You're not going to be able to build a consistent team around the guy on the top left because he he knows his shit. He's done it for 25 years, and chances are you're not going to be able to bring him on like a fresh slate, like you want to do things. Um, whereas this character down here, you likely want. A lot of people who are that, like, you know, that type, people who can just sell really well. Even though he's not in your industry. Well, yeah, because you can learn about product. That was one of the... intelligence is so high. What's the Hudson saying? Intelligence and adaptation is so high. It can move from shit through these. And it depends if the industry specialises or not. We're not selling a specialised industry per se. Good news. For, yeah, what we're currently selling. So. Well, you, you can learn. He looks like a bright young man. <laughs> <laughs> Who do other people think? This is just your opinion. Is there a right answer? No, no, opinion? hell no. Every company is different. But the thing that they figured out is that people that don't think about this question don't take the first step. And so they end up ending up in middle management when they're 45 and getting drunk most nights. Of the I want this guy on my team. I'm going with the girl. Yeah, and why do you choose the girl, Josh? Because she's got sales experience in the industry and she's recently promoted, so she has... From my point of view, she's got a fairly clean slate. You can build it up to how you want it in your company. Yeah, and he's still a rep. And he's still a rep. This guy, you can't really change him. He's 25 years, and this guy just looks like a fluffy. The guy on the top left done $200 million sales as if he's going to come to a company that only, only turns over a certain amount of profit. Would you say no to him, though? Oh, if he came, no. I wouldn't say no to him. But then would you pick him if he was available? Uh, yeah. Why? Two hundred million dollars. I'm just looking at it and just thinking, "Whoa, <laughs> he's in the industry." The reason why I say that is, is that he's currently VP over to is is because he's obviously very adaptable to change. He's been in the industry for twenty five years now. In my industry, twenty five years, if they, they don't change, they don't like change. He's obviously adapted to change, so he's he's moved with the times and moved. Is that quite smart? Or adapt to change. What's that? Sorry. Is that because he's smart that you know adapted to change? It's because he's been in for 25 years and he's still in the industry. Oh, is it? I mean, that car, he looks so trustworthy, that number one sales <laughs> rep. He, like <laughs> he, looks, he looks like a Holden Commodore dealer. That's what he looks like. Is that why Holden uh, oh, oh. Do you want to oh. start on this? Oh. Toyota, okay, outsell, um, Toyota outsell any car industry in, in Australia. So why, why are you Toyota? Because I don't like Japanese crap. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Who would you pick, Jack? Um, I'm leaning more towards the guy on top of that, but I mean, that more information, but um, or I think the girl at the bottom, depending on, I guess, where he's at, if he's a 25 percent year experience, he's going to retire to him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I'm saying he's old, he's a bit older, but he's, he'd definitely be the best person if he was up for it, because he's got that profile behind him, the like million. I think he definitely knows his, his stuff. Um, I definitely wouldn't pick the entrepreneur, depending on... I guess where the company that I'm working for is at. If it's a new company, then maybe if it's a company with a lot of money, then you're not going to pick someone who doesn't know experience. And this person at the bottom doesn't have any sales manager experience, so it'd be either top left or bottom right. Hmm. What's your opinion? Well, did you want to share your opinion? No? I'd just pick someone I get along well with. <laughs> 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 they're all. They're all. <laughs> Pick them all. But if we're growing it over four years and your results and your volume is what you're trying to drive the most at the beginning. Depends what you're trying to drive at the beginning, it's just in the bottom. And that's the company structure thing. So I'm not gonna tell you what I would choose. What is it? Sorry? Yeah. I'm gonna tell you what I did choose. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm awesome and I don't mess around. Yeah? I've actually had to do this so I can share can my experience. Drum roll? Well, you know now, yeah? Look at what I've already done, yeah? I chose Mark Charnley, yeah? Which is which one? 
Which one's Mark Chardonnay? The one on the bottom right. Yeah. 10 years industry experience, recently promoted sales manager. Exactly the match for that. That was my first choice. I did a big presentation to my EO crew and I said, who should I choose? And they said, you either want to choose this guy or this guy. And I said, which one? And I said, you're an entrepreneur, figure it out. So I just went, okay, I'll just choose one or the other because I don't know how to pick. So I just chose this guy. But yeah? is that because you didn't have options for the other two? No, no, I had options for all. I even had options for this. Yeah, and I had someone willing. Yeah. Um, so I chose that and didn't, didn't really go all that well. But I went, okay, I've learned something from that. And then I chose Michael Briganti. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good salesperson, yeah? Yeah, I'm just laughing. And he's, and he's a very good sales rep. Like he's, I've moved him into other jobs where he does a very, very good job. He's very, very good at selling stuff, you know? And we learned from that. And that was, you know, it was quite cool. Sorry. How, what the heck did I just do there? Oh, my God. Fail. All right, if anyone needs any fail. Um, and then the third person that I chose was Sean Scott. Where does Sean Scott fit on that diagram? Top right. Yep, top right, the entrepreneur. So, if it doesn't work out with Sean Scott, who am I going to choose? Top left. Yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's much better. Oh, my God. I think it's much better for those people. Just, click, just, just double click on the slide. Click on the slide at the bottom and then click uh, yeah. view. I fail at computer. Just double click on one of them, sure. There we go. There we go, yay. So that's what I actually did. Cool. Thanks for coming, mate. Thanks for coming. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's unfair to just put people in this category. So, you could have Mark, I think where the company is at at the moment, where it wasn't before. This, it didn't really suit this sort of person. Yeah. And you probably you wouldn't suit the person at the top. You'd have to suit that person there. You know what I mean? But if you were a company that was generating you know, 20 million or more mm. dollars, then maybe you know, these other three would work well. Yeah. All I'm trying to really point out here is think seriously about who you pick. But also, don't not pick. Pick and learn. Because well, you'll get there. When I was making the decision on the entrepreneur, it's, it's where I see Griffin at the moment. That's that's why I went in that one. If, yeah. uh, and this is obviously if all four people are willing to come work for us, I'm assuming. But mm. where uh, the way I see Griffin at the moment, I believe that the top right one would be the most beneficial. Mm. Since I'm his sales exec, I've redesigned sales three times. Mm. Yeah, I think Guy Bonnie left. I thought Sean was competent, so I figured he would use competent people to leave. Mm. Yeah, that's what I said. For, for me, if I was already a sales exec, first one, first one pick for this. Person. You choose a sales rep. Cool. Yeah. Oh, good. But that's fine. Has that worked for you in the past? Sorry? Has that worked for you in the past? Have you not already done that? No. Not on such a large scale. No. So just in review, because we're well over time, use science, not gut, to determine sales ready leads. Measure total reach, not size. And here's our summary. You want to develop a clear and consistent scorecard and hire the same type of successful person every time. You want to train them the same way, use the sales playbook and clear steps in the process. You want to provide each person with the same number and quality of leads and maximize their knowledge of the client. You want to hold marketing accountable for lead quality and quantity. Hold sales accountable for conversion and retention for the first six months. You want to have salespeople work the leads with the same process and you want to use this setup to automate the management process and focus on keeping reporting metric driven. You want to be transparent and regular. You want to create a very clear reward system for the team and you now know what creates a good sales manager. Recruit, train, monitor, coach, motivate and hold accountable. Any questions? The sound presentation? Yeah. If Aaron doesn't mind, could you spend some time talking about if you will have a child five six? Um, about how to supply the Griffin on the front of the stand. Yeah, I I've got some work to do. I need I need I need 